As we consider our meditation, our reading of Mark chapter 9, we might think if we read this passage and the surrounding context that this is not the easiest section of Scripture. Jesus seems to be all over the map as we're reading this gospel lesson. It likely it is a problem with my understanding and not Jesus. I think the disciples, however, were also wrestling with Jesus' message. It seems that they had gotten several issues quite wrong in the last few days, and Jesus was taking them beyond, behind the proverbial woodshed. First, let us understand the context of this lesson, specifically what is just before it, and also, also today we'll consider how it connects to Sunday's gospel. They're all in one cloth. On Sunday, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who are dressed in sheep's clothing and inwardly are ravenous wolves. We discussed on Sunday that sheep stand in need of a pastor who points them to Jesus. When these sheep are trusting in their own flesh and are looking to themselves, when they're troubled by the sin in their mind and heart, they need to be pointed to Christ. Sheep also need a pastor who speaks up and warns them when they are straying, not letting them go down the path of self-chosen works which end only in destruction. destruction. Shepherds uh, need to speak to the sin of their sheep. Sometimes sheep need a good wallop on the head with a rod, and sometimes they need the tender crook of the staff to gently bring them back. Now, if Sunday's text was about being wary of false teachers and was spoken by Jesus to the sheep of what they should look out for, today's message is addressed to the shepherds and is about how much Jesus loves the sheep under their care. Jesus is talking to the pastors, his apostles, the first pastors, and he rebukes them for all of the false ways in which they might hurt the sheep, of which in this section there's many. Recognize that there are false prophets, leaders in the church who are definitely wolves, but there are also good shepherds who operate mistakenly, wrongly, or uncharitably, and in so doing, damage the flock. Jesus will not tolerate the misuse of the sheep. He cares for the sheep deeply and wishes that they not be abused either by evil false shepherds or by ignorant good shepherds. Forgive us, O Lord, for our ways in which we have not loved your sheep. Jesus had just spoken to the disciples about how he was going to Jerusalem to suffer and die. When they arrived at their destination in this place, Capernaum, he asked them what they were talking about on the road. If you know this story, they had been talking on the way about which of them was the greatest. Of course, this is a striking juxtaposition. Jesus had just told them of what he was doing, and on the road, what are they talking about? Who's the greatest among us? How unlike the good shepherd they are here shown to be. Jesus rebukes them, and he sets a child in their midst, and he hugs the child. This is who I care about, he says in so many words. Serving the child means serving someone who will get you no recognition in the eyes of men. Children, especially the smallest of them, are the neediest of creatures. I just went to the beach this week and watched mothers care for young children. I thought to myself, my goodness, I'm glad I don't have young children anymore, right? They're the neediest of creatures, and they offer you no reward or payment for service given. If you're running for office, a child's vote doesn't even count. Jesus tells the disciples that he has called them to servant work. The term used here for servant is diaconus, where we get the word deacon or deaconess. It often refers in language to a menial worker, such as a table waiter, who is usually a slave. Christ comes not as one who expects people to serve him, but as the one who serves by taking our sins upon the tree. Forgive us, Lord, when we pastors want it to be about us, and when we pastors so often seek our own glory and good when you, Lord, took the cross. 
Next, John speaks up, and this is where we pick it up in today's gospel. John the Apostle speaks up. It seems that he's evading the hard and probing questions of the Lord. Maybe he doesn't like the heat, or maybe he's asking an important question. But if he is asking a serious question, he is showing how ignorant he is. He might be the disciple whom Jesus loved, but he was not in this instance one who understood what Jesus' kingdom was about. Yet pause for a moment here. Jesus loved them. How much does this show his patience and his love for these men, the first pastors? How should we also have patience for our pastors if Jesus has so much love and patience for them? If they were so apt to get the focus of ministry wrong, these twelve, how should we also have patience and help our pastors when they operate their ministry in ways that are totally antithetical for what Christ wishes them to care about. Basically, John says this, Lord, the other day we saw some people who aren't really in our group, and they were doing exorcisms in your name. We told them to stop. Told them to stop, Jesus says in so many words. What is your problem? They may not have the same faith that is formed in you, but they were operating in my name. No one who confesses my name in one minute to cast out a demon in my name is in the next minute going to say something evil about me. The fact that they are using my name might show that God's work is slowly forming in their lives. They might not be in our group, but we have the same goal in mind and the same archenemy, the devil. Further, if someone shows you the least kindness as a pastor or tips their hat to your work, they aren't going to lose their reward, no matter how little they really understand about the kingdom. With these words, Jesus is teaching us about uh, uh, teaching us about those whose faith may not be fully formed or who may not be completely aware of all of the finer points of our doctrine. Even the smallest signs of faith should not be trodden upon, but should be lauded and encouraged. We still teach, we still desire for their grading under, greater understanding, but we aim not to rebuke them or to put a stumbling block to faith in their way. We're called to patience, the same patience that God shows to us. Yet next in this section, Jesus uses an analogy that reminds me of many of the byways in Lancaster County. Can you, ro can you go down any road in Lancaster County and not see some millstone somewhere? I wrote this sermon, and I'm driving here, and I see two along the way. Now from here on out, those two millstones will remind me of this text every time I drive to church. On one such road, another road near my home, there's an old stone building near a stream where I often bicycle. There must be a total of about 10 millstones lined there along the makeshift fence, seemingly for decoration. I don't know what millstones and decoration have, but uh, some people seem that they like their yard decorated in them. You might know that there are large stones around two feet or more in diameter with a sizable five or so inch hole in the center. Maybe it's smaller. I don't know if three people could pick up and lift these stones. I've never tried, but they're quite heavy. If a rope was put around them and tied around my neck and I was thrown into the depths of the ocean that I just went to, I wouldn't stand a chance. But this horrific punishment is what Jesus says should be done to me if I would cause one of the little ones trusting in him to sin. These people may be little and unimportant and only do so much as give a cold glass of water to their pastor, but to the Lord, the faith of one who trusts in him is precious. He regards their growing faith as so great that such a pastor who would put a stumbling block to faith in their way is as good as dead and should suffer the weight of such a fearful punishment. Unless we think that this would be only temporal punishment and not eternal, Jesus clarifies and leaves us with one final image. To his disciples, what does he say? If anything you do with your hands, 
causes you to fail in service of one of the Lord's sheep, cut it off. If any errands you walk on, on your feet, is a wrong one in your care for these sheep. If any way you look at a parishioner is wrong with your eyes, it would be better for you to remove those offending appendages with a knife than to end up in hell where the worm that eats does not die and the fire there is never quenched. What do we make of these texts? How dear God's whole, God holds you his sheep. How much he loves his sheep. How much this passage reminds me of Isaiah 42, which, where it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not snuff out. How much faith before our Lord thinks that you are deserving of his deep care and protection. Even the smallest trembling flicker. He loves you so much that he faithfully and patiently trains these 12 pastors for several years so that the sheep can be given faithful shepherds. He loves you, his sheep, so much that he warns any pastor that would care for you wrongly that he will judge them eternally and severely. May God unite shepherd and sheep as they endeavor to together live in faith in the Lord Jesus. May he strengthen pastor and people as they seek to be faithful and follow the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. May we be saved from false shepherds and be provided with faithful shepherds who will rightly care for us. And may the Lord, through this work of faithful pastoring, bring us to the eternal sheepfold, where we will dwell eternally with our great shepherd, Jesus, and his Father, who gave his Son to be the good shepherd, the one who gave his life for the sheep. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.